the Palestinian propagandists online have no issue lying, which makes the task of Israel incredibly difficult. You know, you're playing to a series of rules and guidelines which your enemy is not. Shalom, I'm Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy and welcome to State of a Nation, where I take you between the lines and beyond the headlines. Before we dive into today's conversation, let's catch up on the latest news. It's February 14th, day 131 of the October 7th war. After the massacre, Iran's proxies in Lebanon, Hezbollah joined the war on the side of Hamas. Today, in a significant escalation, Hezbollah launched a barrage of rockets deeper into northern Israel. In response, the Israeli Air Force conducted a wave of airstrikes against Hezbollah targets in Lebanon, including some belonging to its elite Radwan unit. Speaking from his bunker yesterday, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah insisted the terror group would continue its attacks on Israel until the end of the war in Gaza. In more news from the ground, or rather underground, the IDF has breached a compound where Hamas leader Yehya Sinwar was hiding earlier in the war while fighting raged above him. In that bunker, millions of dollars in cash. Footage released yesterday shows Sinwar on the 10th of October scurrying through the tunnels with his wife and children unmistakable by the silhouette of his ears. And part of the war is the media war. Just yesterday, Al Jazeera claimed that one of its journalists was injured in an IDF strike. Today, it turned out that Ismail Abu Omar is a deputy company commander in the Hamas Khan Yunis Brigade who infiltrated Israel on October 7th. He's not the first terrorist masquerading as a journalist, and he probably won't be the last. This media war is critical which is why I wanted to get the perspective of Nathaniel Buzolic. Since October 7th, he's been shining a light on the Hamas atrocities of that dark day. The Hollywood actor turned activist, better known as Nate Buzz, rose to fame with his appearance in the Vampire Diaries. He's neither Israeli nor a Jew, but an Australian born-again Christian. With his new media outfit, Rover Media, speaking to Gen Z, he's been fighting Israel's corner in the media battle exposing and uncovering the painful stories of Hamas's victims. While terrorist leaders hide in the shadows, Buzolic has become a prominent voice in the pro-Israel world, and despite a deluge of abuse online, he persists and speaks his truth. As memories of the October 7th massacre recede, the world can feel like a lonely place for those still fighting to bring the hostages home and the Hamas terror regime to justice. So what's driving Nate Buzz to take a firm moral stance when he could be thousands of miles away, enjoying life in Hollywood and staying shamefully silent like so many in the wake of Hamas's barbaric atrocities? It's time for me and Nate to explore the state of our nation. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. What happens when the four-day pause? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't why Nathaniel Buzolic, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I wanted to create some buzz around the show, so I thought I'd bring Mr. Buzz himself. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I promise that's the last dad joke of the show. Oh, perfect. Then we can move forward from there. So I know why... why um, I've invited you here on the podcast. I want to know what you're doing here. What are you doing in Israel? You're an actor from Australia, thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here in Israel? Yeah, you know, that's sometimes a question I, I ask myself uh, purely because, you know, it was never something where I, I ever thought that I would be in a position where I'd be on such a show like this, um, speaking on behalf of an entire nation of people that are not my own. Uh, I'm not Jewish. I'm not Israeli. But... Um, you know, my first trip to Israel was in 2017. And, okay. And, um, you know, and since that that first trip, I've, I've really kind of attached myself to the idea of what Israel represents. And what does Israel represent in your mind? In my mind, it's the uh, covenant relationship that Hashem has with his people. And, uh, you know, it's as an outsider looking at the, the Jewish story, understanding the patterns of the Torah and the Tanakh, I'm... I'm always inspired when I land in Israel. I get to Ben Gurion Airport and I see the Israeli flag waving on a land that was promised to them so long ago. Um, and I know that's kind of a hard thing for a lot of audience members to probably listen to because you know you got a lot of secular people, mm -hmm. maybe some religious people. But you know, I'm I'm purely motivated by you know the perspective that there was a promise made to one specific person, Abraham, who is the father of this this Jewish nation, and that promise is 
a very physical promise in a land and that land has been returned to the ancestral people and no other people group have ever been able to reclaim the ancestral homeland like the nation of Israel has. Which is, I think, what confuses a lot of people when they speak about Israel in the context of colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. That there simply is no other example of an indigenous people in a land who were exiled and then managed to return to their native land. And that's the connection you see with Israel? Yeah, absolutely. And that's probably why people struggle with it. Um, Because it doesn't really fit the mold of anything that they're familiar with. No, not at all. You know, and, and often you see the hypocrisy of just that idea alone, even from, you know, the country of my origin, Australia, where we've had over the last two decades a massive push to acknowledge, identify, remember um, and reflect over the ancestral people of Australia, which is the Aboriginal people. Um, and, you know, every national event, every sporting event, there's an acknowledgement of the ancestral people of Australia and the Aboriginal people are acknowledged. And then you see the hypocrisy of the Australian government going, well, we're not going to acknowledge that the Jewish people, the ancestral people of this nation. Oh, curious. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's like we're living in a, a world of hypocrisy put on display and it's open, it's public. And, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's Hashem allowing the foolishness of men to be shown to all people. Interesting. I'm wondering, how did you become a supporter of Israel? Because you've become very outspoken, Mm -hmm. uh, very prominent, spending a lot of time here on the ground, especially since October 7th. Have you always seen yourself as being a fan of Israel? Is this a a new discovery or awakening? No, not at all. No, I, I, you know, it was, I was raised, my, 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 my mother was born in Egypt. She was born in a refugee camp after the second world war. How did she get to a refugee camp in Egypt? Uh, she, my grandmother was from Croatia, uh, from a little island called Kvar. Um, communism had swept through all of Eastern Europe uh, off of the back of, you know, the, the Second World War. And, um, you know, there was a lot of atrocities that happened um, in Eastern Europe to, mm-hmm. to you know, to Jewish, um, uh, the Jewish identity. You know, there was death camps and horrific things that had happened. Um, and so from what I understand with my past, my grandmother and my grandfather were... Uh, living in this island, um, they were opposed to this new communist regime and, and the things that were happening in, um, in the former Yugoslavia at the time. Uh, my grandfather was shot and killed, my grandmother fled, and my mum my was born in a refugee camp as a result of that. Um, so I'm a first generation Australian, um, but I grew up in a very, very Islamic um, Arab community in Sydney, Australia, Okay. Um, which many people don't know about. Um, and you wouldn't expect that when you think about Australia, you think about, you know, surfers, beach, you know, blonde hair, but there is a huge, uh, Arab Islamic community, uh, in Sydney, Australia. Was Israel a lively topic of discussion? Absolutely. Growing up. Um, but from the other perspective, you know, so what were you growing up hearing about Israel? Apartheid, genocide, occupiers. Genocide, they were saying back then. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's just the sort of standard, you know, title, protocol, uh, injected language um, into this narrative that's been going on for, you know, decades. And so growing up in that, in that Arab Islamic world has really been beneficial to understanding and having the right perspective of what's really unfolding here uh, in 2024. And so I think when a lot of people look at me, they think I'm just a Hollywood actor, that a life of privilege. Just a Hollywood actor. We yeah. should be so lucky. Yeah. But, um, but my childhood reflected something very different. You know, I would, I would go to my neighbors for Ramadan. I would celebrate Eid with them. I, I understand. How are your neighbors reacting now to you becoming uh, such a prominent advocate for Israel? Are you still uh, in touch? Not, uh, not as, as much as I would like. Um, you know, they're Lebanese, Palestinian to be specific. Mm-hmm. to be specific, um, you know, and I guess for me growing up, I really learned the foundation of um, that world and their framework, which is crucially important um, before you start having any sort of conversation about what's happening in Israel. You need to understand the frameworks of And both. what is that framework? Help us understand how are these people regarding Israel? What do they see when they look at us? Because we know what we stand for. We Mm -hmm. know why we are fighting against Hamas. We know what we're doing, but they don't see that. They see a very different picture. How does Israel look through that lens? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing you need to understand or from an outsider, not Jewish, not Arab or Muslim, I, I look at these two groups of people and the basis of Judaism, I would say, is the foundational understanding 
is uh, a mercy and compassion culture. And I, th I think we really see that reflected in how Israel operates on a world scale and how Israel operates internally. You know, I mean, even what do you mean a mercy and compassion culture? Mercy and compassion. You would rather spend trillions of dollars on an iron dome than spending the same amount of money destroying the people that you're living next to. Of course, because what we're trying to do is defensive. Exactly. And so compassion and mercy is almost like the default setting of Israel. They will go to great lengths to avoid civilian casualties. When there's an earthquake in Turkey, in Syria, in Morocco, it's generally Israel that will say, hey, we're going to send people. We're going to send aid. We're going to find ways to help you. Um, they put their differences aside. Now, an Arab Islamic culture is not the same as the Jewish understanding of mercy and compassion. I would say that their real foundational understanding is honor and shame. And you see that reflected in their governments. You see that reflected in their cultures. And so that creates a huge problem, especially when you have uh, a conflict such as the Palestinians and the Israelis. If we go back to 1948 and we see this independence war, they've lost every single battle they started. And that's something that is, I imagine, profoundly humiliating well, within that culture. Moving from the position of honor, uh, having you know, uh, an idea of this belongs to us, going into a position of shame in their minds. And so I think that creates a real dilemma because you can't offer people in a position of shame anything that's going to make them happy with the solution unless it's the defeat of those who took away their, their pride. And so when you understand that, and you know, the other thing that I've, I really... No, that, that's, it's fascinating that you're saying that because one of the questions that I find myself confronting all the time is not only whether it's possible to persuade the people in the middle who haven't made up their minds about Israel, but the people on the other side who are actively anti-Israel and whether there is a way to convince them and bring them over to our side and convince them we're not the evil bloodsuckers mm -hmm. that, uh, that you know they think we are. Do you think that's possible within this paradigm that you understand of, of how Israel is understood within the Islamic Arab world? I think it's a, it's an extremely difficult road to walk for Israel being the one non, you know, Islamic Arab community in the Middle East. You know, uh, it's this bizarre circumstance we find ourselves in where the world falls in love with the underdog and the world assumes that the Palestinians and the Arab populace who refuses to accept Israel's identity are the underdogs. And I guess if you look at it from a micro point of view, you go, oh, yeah, they are the underdogs because Israel has a stronger army. But you only have to zoom out and you only have to get to 30,000 feet to realize, no, 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 the real underdog is the Jewish state. Right. They're the minority in every circumstance, every situation. They're surrounded by uh, nations and enemies that have wanted to destroy them for the last 76 years. And it's only by sheer determination and, and personally, in my opinion, that the favor of Hashem that has allowed this nation to continue to exist, but not only exist, prosper. Um, and so, you know, when you look at it like that, I think it's most people are just so looking at the, the micro day to day happenings of what's going on between Israel and, you know, the Gaza Strip right now, but they're not really going and looking at the bigger picture. Which is fascinating because for us, it's so obvious that Israel is still largely the David against the Goliath, yes. a much ra larger Arab Muslim world, which we're hoping to move towards with normalization and peace, but still a much larger world that we're up against. And in the Western world, it's not seen that way. And, and I really want to pick your brains about um, young audiences mm -hmm. in particular, Gen Z. We've seen mm -hmm. really horrific polls in the United States mm -hmm. suggesting that half of American youth support Hamas. Yes. Not the Palestinians, Hamas. What is going on there? How did this poisonous ideology somehow manage to take over? The, it appears we've lost the young generation in the West to this evil, barbaric, rapist death cult. Yeah. Uh, one word, narrative. You know, I, I think Israel made the mistake of saying we, we are on the side of truth. Eventually the world or the outsider is going to get it. But what I think 2023 and 2024 taught us is it's not enough to be presenting the truth. It's how I present the truth as the narrative for a young Gen Z audience to understand. What do you mean? So the Palestinian propagandists online are brilliant at creating, shifting and curating narrative. How are they doing that? Well, one advantage they have is they have no issue lying, which makes the task of Israel incredibly difficult. 
You know, you're playing uh, to a series of rules and guidelines, which your enemy is not. And so, and we find that, by the way, not only in the public information war, but in the war on the ground in the Gaza Strip as well, where absolutely. we find ourselves trying to adhere to these very strict norms of international law while dealing with an enemy that has as much regard for humanitarian law as it does for basic yeah. humanity. And no, ca- no accountability. Zero accountability. You know, I mean, I sometimes sit, you know, because I spend so much time thinking about what's happening, but you, you ponder at the beginning of this war, who was sitting in the tunnels of Gaza, the heads of Hamas going, how many deaths should we claim happen today? Is 7,000 too much? Maybe too much. Let's go 8,000. 8,000, I don't know. Let's like, let, they just, it just seems like they're throwing numbers out because they know it doesn't matter and they know they don't actually have to account for but that. But it's not just a question of specific facts or fake facts that get thrown out. There mm-hmm. is something about the Palestinian narrative mm-hmm. that seems to have enchanted people around the world that seems to give them a fire and a passion in their belly in a way that Israel's story, the story of the rebirth of a persecuted people in their ancient homeland isn't cutting through and the Palestinian message of violent resistance is. So why do you think that message is, why do you think Gen Z around the world are so receptive or primed to hear that Palestinian message of violent struggle and and somehow be inspired or moved by it? I think a lot of it is just the patterns of, I mean, we could even go back and look at what the Nazis were able to achieve with divisive uh, approaches to convincing a people to take their side. You know, we think about the religious element. So we say, well, it's Islam against the Jews. And when you have 1.9 billion Muslims and let's be fair, 15.4 million Jews all around the world, you're already outnumbered. So that's one place of division that they can enter. The next one is ethnically, you know, because a lot of people don't understand that, you know, Jewish people are not only a belief system, but an an ethnicity, sorry, an ethnicity. So you've got the Arabs against the Jews. And once again, you're outnumbered. Um, And so then they move into the political scope. And we're living in a time where people are moving away from what is good um, and what you know, the Torah and the Tanakh would present as the goodness, which would ultimately be Hashem. And now we're taking that and we're saying, I don't need a God to tell me who's good. I decide what's good. And in that framework, we have the social justice warrior. And in order for the social justice warrior to fulfill the desire of their belief system, they need to find an oppressor and an oppressed people. And so I think in a lot of ways, the Palestinians don't get enough credit for their brilliant marketing strategies, understanding their audience. They understand how to pull at the heartstrings of the Western world. They know how to pull at the heartstrings of Christians who by all rights should be like me, read your Bible, understand the patterns and know this is the same enemy that has reared its head over and over again to deceive the world with a lie. And what do we do about that? The dilemma is within the Jewish culture, because I think about these things and I think to myself, why can Israel not work out the PR game? And I pondered this and I pondered this. We're trying. You're trying. We have a podcast now. You have a podcast now. And hopefully this is the, uh, this is the answer, but it's a cultural thing again. When you think about, you know, the core idea of Judaism, you're not in the business of converts. You won't find Jewish people going, well, let's go and make as many Jewish converts all over the world. It's not a proselytizing religion. Absolutely not. And so that creates a dilemma in a scenario like this, because think about the idea. It's fascinating. I never really thought of it like this. Yeah. So think about the idea of what Christians and Muslims are called to do. I'm a Christian. My job as a Christian, if I truly want to take on the task, is to understand what I am, understand who I am, and now present that idea to someone who's not my own. Whereas we wake up in the morning, know exactly who we are and hope that other people are going to leave us alone and let us get on with our lives. Exactly what Moshe said to Pharaoh. Let us, let my people go so we can go into a wilderness and worship our God. We don't need you. We don't want you to be a part of it. It's fine. You do you, we'll do us and we're all fine. And so I think that cultural element of, uh, you know, the Jewish belief system now creates problems when now you have forced to enter into a conversation and into a world where you have to show people and prove to people who you are against an enemy who's doing the exact same thing, but tenfold. Fascinating. And now you've 
try to join these efforts as well with this new media outlet that mm -hmm. you've established, Rover Media, on Instagram here on the ground, telling stories of survivors and yep. hostage families. Let's watch a, a short clip from yep. some of the content you've been creating. And then I want you to tell me what, what you're trying to do with this project. Mm -hmm. Let's watch. I have three children. My girl's birthday is October 8th, but uh, since it was the weekend, we celebrated Friday night. So we all went out uh, to a restaurant nearby. We had a good time. We woke up, it was around half past six, from the sirens from Seva Dome. Agar took the kids to the safe room and I went outside to see what was going on. And then I saw Vigai. She's uh, Uya's friend from uh, kindergarten. And she was full of blood. And I saw her full of blood, but I could see she wasn't hurt. It wasn't her blood. And I took her and gave it to my wife. And I ran outside, you know, I said, I have to do something to help. And my wife stayed at home. So I kept texting her. I, I told her, I'm okay, how are you? And she said, I'm okay. And then around 11, I told her, I'm fine, how are you? And she said, somebody's coming in. And that's it. And no more messages. And uh, I was devastated. I was sure they were dead. Sunday evening, I got a call and uh, I was told that they were seen alive, being led into Gaza. And this was the best news I ever received in my life. Well, explain to people who don't understand what this feeling is like, what your day is like. You know, I'm a great believer. I have my faith and, uh, you know, everybody in Israel is praying for me. There's many times in the Tanakh where God talks about setting people who are prisoners free, bring them home. I was at the hotel yesterday. I prayed for those who are still hostages in Gaza. And I prayed that, um, that it would be Hashem's right hand that would make a straight path from Gaza back to these people's homes. They're so small, you know, I got a four-year-old son over there and a 10-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy. I see no desire for revenge. I'm amazed at your ability to be calm in what is by far the worst situation of your life. This thing is, is not political. You know? An interview with Avichai Brodic there, whose family were abducted into Gaza. What are you trying to achieve with this media platform, Rover Media? Yeah, Rover Media is, um, is you know, stepping into the fight and bringing back the, um, the truth with narrative. You know, I, stories like that. You know, I remember that day where I met Avi Haim. I met a, a man who had nothing but, but faith. And, um, you know, for those who, who don't know the rest of his story, his family came home. You know, he's one Thank of God. the... Yeah, uh, he's one of the families who was lucky enough to have their hostages come home. And I remember when I got news that Abby Heim's family came back, I, uh, I, I cried. I broke down in tears um, and thanked Hashem for doing what he did, you know, because, um, you know, it's, it's a tragedy. But it, again, it's like this is an example why, you know, I started Rover because I knew that October 7th wasn't going to get the attention it deserved for the world to understand what the Jewish people have really been through. Which is shocking because as you say, you know, you within your culture go out and tell the world and we expect the world to just leave us alone. October 7th happened and suddenly it seemed so obvious to us that everyone would understand the evil that we are fighting against mm -hmm. and stand by our side and felt fairly betrayed when we said we were fighting for humanity and discovered how much of humanity didn't want it fighting for us. Absolutely. You know, didn't want us fighting for it. Israel had a really difficult decision. Uh, October 8th, 9th, 10th, moving forward. Um, we live in a world because of social media where everything is move on to the next. We scroll, we scroll. And, and I, you know, I, I'm not saying that uh, Israel made a bad decision by, um, you know, attacking Gaza immediately, but I think had they stopped and let the world breathe and permeate over what October 7th was, um, it, it might have been a lot more helpful um, for people to really get a grasp of what the Palestinian movement has been all about. Unfortunately, and allow that shock to sink in. To sink in, because once the airstrikes happened, we gave the Palestinian narrative their content, their, their rebranding of the message, their changing. And, you know, if you go back to my earlier Instagram, um, you know, videos that I started making immediately after October 7th, I said, now the Palestinians are going to start scrambling. Now they're going to start trying to move everything back to them being the victim to cover up, to hide, to conceal 
the true heart of what they've always wanted to do, which was October 7th, you know, f- uh, you know, free Palestine from the river to the sea. Yes, yeah, so exactly... now we see what exactly what they would do if they had a chance to, yeah. to move anywhere between yeah. the river and the sea. So, uh, Nathaniel, you're the first guest from the world of entertainment that mm-hmm. I've had here on the show. And the truth is, we don't have that long a list of prospective guests from entertainment yeah. because Hollywood has been pretty silent. Yeah. Um, a lot of people we would have expected to speak up for Israel and Israelis' basic human rights after October 7th are feeling scared and intimidated mm-hmm. because even those who are with us in their hearts know that they could face a personal, social or professional price. And I'm wondering, have you paid any sort of price for your support for Israel? Are you scared that you may yet pay a price? Yeah, I mean, I get death threats all the time post October 7th. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is a serious issue. Um, and it credible is, death threats? Yes, or absolutely. Credible death threats. Yeah, credible. How do you deal with those? Uh, it takes a certain type of personality to want to step into this space. And so I can't, you know, accuse celebrities for not having a desire to speak up. Um, because when you have family, when you have children, when you have, um, you know, a life that you've created for yourself, it's not so easy just to give it all up and, um, and stand for, um, you know, stand for a nation that might not be your own or that you don't really have a real connection with. You know, it, it really does take someone to either have a great amount of faith or a deep, deep love. Um, and then, you know, the, the real proof of love is when you're willing to sacrifice something, you know, so. And what do you fear you might sacrifice? I mean, is there a possibility of n- not getting the next acting job? Yeah, look, or... I, look now I'm, I'm politically divisive now, according to the world, you know, and from a business perspective, you think about these, these celebrities in, in positions of influence, you know, that you have to understand their life is business. They're, my number one goal in life is not to be famous. It's not to be rich. My number one goal is to honor Hashem. And so I have a very, very different uh, approach to life. But when I take that lens off and I put their lens on, and I think, okay, from a, just a business point of view. It why, makes no sense to why, stand with Israel. Why would I stand with Israel? Why am Horrific. I going to stand with 15 million people when I could stand with 1.9 billion? It just doesn't make sense. Um, also this, you know, I, I worked on a very, very popular TV show in the US, several actors, um, came up to me and were grateful for what I was sharing and doing so they could have a better understanding. I, you know, I have some really, really massive, uh, international celebrities who have also DM'd me. I, I won't name their names because I don't want to uh, put them in any sort of position. That, but these are people who are not speaking out publicly. They're not speaking out publicly. And, you know, we often think to win this battle on social media, it's to get everyone to become pro-Israel. And I don't agree with that. No, what is the battle? I think the battle is to get people to not say anything unless they're educated. You know, hmm. if we can get a celebrity to not be pro-Palestinian, that's a victory in my books. But except they think it's the trendy thing to do now. Well, it is trendy, you know, and we've made it trendy and we, we live in a world where trends How is what drives us. How on did death squads and barbaric gang rape ever become trendy? Yeah, well, that's, that is, a great reflection of where we are at in humanity. You know, October 7th has exposed the brokenness of humans, if we're being fair. You know, because you're right, we're, we're struggling to make sense of whether they're a freedom fighter or a terrorist. Right, it just seems that, you know, getting back to this discussion about Gen Z, it's a whole generation that seems completely morally lost. I mean, something is clearly deeply morally and philosophically rotten in their lives if this is the sort of thing that is giving them excitement and encouragement. And so what's going to break that? Uh, Individuals and people who are willing to not go up or not go with the flow and actually go upstream, challenge what's being presented. And, you know, I I hope that, you know, initiatives like Rover Media where people can get educated and people like myself can make other people in similar positions have a little bit more confidence in not falling to the traps of, you know, this cancel culture, you know, uh, abusive tactics of this pro-Palestinian movement where they're like, we want to force everybody to be like us. So I want to do something here that will actually give viewers and listeners a little bit more confidence Mm -hmm. in a sort of topsy-turvy, upside-down way. Sure. We have some of the death threats that you've been receiving here that will show up on the screen. And I I want to read them and get your reaction just because I want people to understand what you're dealing with, understand that you're bouncing back, fighting back, and hopefully... That sense of fighting spirit will 
give them the encouragement to hold their heads up high as well. Sure. So these are some of the threats uh, you've been getting. Tell me what you think about them. Dog of the Jews. Mm. True or not true? Uh, I would I would probably say friend of the Jews before friend dog. Friend of the Jews but before if, dog. Yeah. Well, dog is a man's best friend. Yeah. Uh, Gaza children doesn't matter cause they Muslim, right? You racist, Islamophobic. Now Disagree he, with that assessment. Here's a perfect right? example. Uh, this is what I, I actually find quite interesting as a Christian. There's no word for someone who hates Christianity. You know? Is that not? No. So like if you mock Christianity, there's no word that you can be like, oh, well, that's Christian phobic or that's, you know, you're, you're anti-Jesus. Why or, is that? Because we just accept the fact that people are going to hate what we say. And it's part of our, you know, fascinating thing about Jesus when he spoke to his followers, he said, they will hate you because they hated me first. And so one of the reasons why I can stand so comfortably in this position is because I expect it. And when it comes, I'm not worried when it does, because I've already been pre-warned by Jesus that this is the reality walking forward. Now, what that does is actually prove something, you know, if I came to you and said, hey, you know, follow me, I'm going to give you a great life. Everyone's going to love you. You're going to be absolutely adored and appreciated. You're never going to have any conflict. You're like, sure, no worries. But if I said to you, hey, if you follow me, everyone's going to hate you. It's going to be a harder road. You're going to have to give up a lot of things that you love to do. And you're going to have to be a reflection of me daily. Your responsibility is going to be greater than everyone else's. you are like, well, what do I get? And you get, you get absolutely nothing. But you get the joy of knowing that you follow me, not out of the benefit, but out of love. And so when I receive these sort of oh, comments... And if we can get these back on screen, yeah. I want to go through another couple yeah. of these. So we've had dog of the Jews. We've yep. had the this Islamophobic. We don't like your not Jews. A lot of your uh, hate mailers seem to be fairly illiterate. We don't like your not Jews. You and people like you. Child murderers like you, mm. Zionists. False Israel is using Hamas as a reason and excuse to kill all Palestinians, period, says the uh, hate mailer. Israel also funded Hamas, again, to make an excuse and a reason to kill all Palestinians and do ethnic cleansing. This is stuff in your DMs, we should say, just from today. Just from today. And here perhaps is our, is our favorite. You're a clueless moron <laughs> who loves to run their mouth on social media, spewing <laughs> verbal diarrhea for simpletons who follow you and your like-minded, <laughs> incomplete, incompetent thoughts. Shame on you, but also prepare to be at peace with hellfire. Gosh, mm. at the end of your miserable, false truth-seeking life that you have misled <laughs> so many people on, period, imbecile, period. I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing these and it's That's easy nice. It's easy to laugh, but a lot of people yeah. would be intimidated and say, you know yeah. what, if I'm getting this hate mail, it's just not worth it. Yeah, look, maybe. Um, but, you know, look, uh, I've, sh I've shared this story a few times. You know, there, I, was a, I was at a point in my life where I wanted it to be over. I was in Iraq, 2016. I saw the atrocities of what ISIS had done. Um, I was at a low point in my life. I was a very successful actor. I had money, but I, I felt empty on the inside. And I mm. remember saying to God, if this is the best life is, I don't want it anymore. I'm done. Take my life from me. And a simple whisper went into my heart, which said, if you're that willing to give up your life, give it up to me. What's the difference? And so what makes someone dangerous to the Palestinian movement is people who don't care about being loved. They don't care about getting ahead and they don't care if they're going to uh, have the easy road of life. All they care about is the truth and what's morally correct. And for me, I, I realize that God has such a deep love for the Jewish people. Uh, I see an unfair, unjustified hatred, which breaks my heart every single day. You know, one of the most difficult moments while I was working with uh, Rover Media back in October, November, was when I met with some of the survivors from the Nova Festival and um, a few soldiers who fought against the terrorists on October 7th. And every single person I met in Nikki Love Hospital were incredibly kind, beautiful, peace-seeking people. And every single time I left the hospital room after hearing the atrocities and the experiences that they went through, it broke my heart because it's not fair. You have a people so full of hate on one side, which the world is in love with, and a peaceful, beautiful people on the other side, which the world doesn't seem to care about. And so if I'm going to make a choice in this lifetime, I'm going to choose the side of peace, loving, kind, generous people, which is the nation of Israel. That's really beautiful. Thank you. It's the truth. Since I don't want to end on hate mail, I want yeah. to end with love. So yeah. I have some uh, quick fire questions I want to ask you. Sure. Since you've spent, how many times have you been in Israel? This will be 28th, I believe. Not since the beginning of the war? No. No. Okay. No. That's so, so smart. So I want to run through a few things. I want you to tell me what's your favorite in Israel. Okay. okay. Uh, favorite beach? Uh, Hilton. City. Uh, the Galilee. So probably Capernaum. You might not know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite sea, Med Dead or Red? I'm going to say the Dead Sea. 
Dead Sea. Yeah. Favorite market? Hmm. I guess there's at the Yehuda market in Jerusalem. The Mahane Yehuda yeah. market. Good yeah. choice. Good choice. Yeah. Favorite food? Favorite food. Cool. I don't like Jacques Nun. Everyone talks it up. But I, <laughs> I'm not a fan of it. I don't know what the, uh, the uh, maybe uh, Shashuka. Shashuka. Shashuka is yeah. a good choice. Yeah. Shashuka is a good choice. Favorite street? Favorite street. Uh, I don't know the name of the street, um, but I, I guess it's the road from um, Tiberius to uh, to Capernaum. Uh, it's a, a windy road that sort of wraps around the Galilee. Uh, I don't know its name, but I, I love that road and just sort of driving around the Galilee, especially at sunrise. Not on my short list, but I will have to check it out. Yeah. Favorite biblical character? Uh, King David. King David. Why King David? Uh, because often he's looked at as like this beloved character uh, in the Torah. But when you actually pay attention to the details of his life, he was misunderstood. He was always on the run and rejected. Uh, he wasn't really accepted by his family, uh, his sons, uh, his, his community. Um, and he really had a heart after God. Um, so... He did it the difficult way, but he always knew that it was Hashem that he was pursuing and no one else. Hmm. Favorite Hebrew word? My girlfriend taught me this and I have to repeat it. Uh, it's atzodeket. Atzodeket, yeah. which means you're right. Yes. yeah. I think you're, you're going to stay in her good books if you <laughs> say you're right. I will. Favorite Hebrew curse word? Zona. <laughs> which we will not translate well, into I, English. Yes, but it's, um, it's actually biblical. I one day was reading, uh, <laughs> I was reading the, uh, I think it was in uh, Jeremiah, and I wanted to understand how serious God was because he was accusing Israel of whoredom. And he said, you know, Zona. And I was like, ah, what was Zona? I went, and I remember saying it to someone in Israel, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, God was serious. Uh, favorite person in Israel. Favorite person in Israel? Favorite person oh. in Israel. Well, that would have to be Leah Noga, my girlfriend. Ah, tell me about her. Yeah, uh, she's amazing. Um, you know, she is uh, someone that was uh, a huge support system for me in very, very difficult days. I mean, that video with Avi Haim, you can see that my eyes were red and that's just because every single day I met people who were going through the worst possible circumstance of anyone's life and I was breaking into tears and crying and just carrying that emotional burden every single day. Um, and I built a really great relationship with Leah before we started dating. But every single night we would go and we'd eat hamburgers and I would just be able to forget about, you know, um, the, the harshness of what, what we were dealing with um, at that point in time, which gave me the strength to do it all again the next day. Um, so, yeah, she's my favorite person for sure. Well, that definitely sounds like a good uh, reason. Yeah, she's a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Nathaniel, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate thank you. it. Yeah. And that's it for today's episode of the State of a Nation podcast. Please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Elon Levy. Thank you very much for joining us.